you may be seated. Thank you for that introduction, Pastor Malcolm. So I might tell on myself a little bit. I think I might do that just a little bit before we just dive into this message. Because we're here, we're a ministry, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, we're here to, you know, we, we, we look at what the, the minister, the pastor, the preacher, the teacher comes to the pulpit is, is up here to do. And we're here to teach, to preach, to exhort, to warn. And I'm thankful that, that, that God gives us what we need when we need it. So I'll say that I am so thankful for all the musicians, and we're kind of down a few today. But also looking at ministry. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to get to what's on the sign and the, and the message here in a minute. But it's about ministry. And, I, and this is where I tell on myself. If I, I knew I had the message, if I got ahead and, and, and talked to, to Brother Ar, uh, Deacon Armand, he'd have been able to play all those songs. And I could have, I, I could have sat and, and worshipped. So, if I'm telling on myself, and this is this is all for free. Where are we at in ministry? What do we need to do that we say, "I got this," and and, and men sing our praises and say he was de- determined to do it, and, and I appreciate that. But how many how many times do we say we got this when we could back up a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, and get ahead of that and say, "I know I can do this." I know I can do all this myself and I can make it work. And nobody does it better than me. But what's going to happen if I'm not here? What what, what happens if, if, if Pastor Malcolm talking about unexpected things happening? What happens if, if, if I get into an accident and I'm not here and I've not prepared anybody else to do what I do? This is about ministry. This isn't about just saying everybody's wrong. This is about ministry going forward. And, and, and the, the marquee says faithfully betrothed. Betrothed to what? We're in the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, we've got jobs to do. The whole, the foot, the hand. Well, unlike my body, I've got two feet. Body of Christ, we've got more than two feet. It seems kind of odd, but we've got a lot of feet. We've got a lot of hands. Anyway, that was all for free. Why? Because I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged to see people here. I'm encouraged about the fact that, you know, we got cameras, we got internet, we got a message going around the world. People can hear the things that you get up here and share, not just the things that I get up here and share, the things that you guys get up here and share, the things, the testimonies that you bring forth. Amen. Those are tes- testimonies. You, you get the chance to testify around the world of the goodness of God. When we, when we do the things we do here, we testify of God. All right, enough of that. Faithfully betrothed. I want to add another line under that title, and it's, what are you waiting for? Now, we can look at that phrase in a couple different ways. What are you waiting for? Like, hey, you're supposed to do this. What are you waiting for? And then you can look at it as, what am I waiting on? What am I waiting to happen? You know, what, what, what am I expecting to come? What, what, have, what have I set my eyes on? What are you waiting for? The theme scripture is Revelations 21, 9, and 10. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of the heaven from God. That new Jerusalem, not anything old, new. The bride of Christ, the church. Those that have been waiting, that have been faithfully betrothed. I'm going to come back to this, but we talk about a buzz phrase in religion, security of the believer. That means a lot of bit different things to a lot of different people, just you know, depending on where you're at, what, where you grew up, what church, what doctrine. But let's just kind of make that plain, the security of the believer. You know, we talk about our salvation, that day we, we got saved. And we remember that day because it's an important day. But what is salvation? Is it that day? Is that something we relate to that day? Is it a one-and-done thing? 
security. If you're secure in something, it's about a relationship. My wife and I stood before an altar and, and, and exchanged vows and said, I do. That was the beginning of something beautiful. But that doesn't, I can't just say, well, we, I said I do 20, 24 years ago. That's it. I'm done. No. I got to say I do every day. I, I, I have to look at her every day and, and renew my love for her every day and the things that I do. Because it's easy to stand up here in front of a bunch of people, especially when you're nervous and, and the pastor's giving you all the words to say. But, but the, but next day and the next day and every day beyond that. Now you're, you're squeezing, from, squeezing from the same tube of toothpaste. You're, you're using the same bathroom. You're using, you're, yeah. You're, 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 you're getting, you're, you're sharing, maybe you're sharing a car. You're sharing tools. You're sharing the kitchen. Yeah, that's a big one right there. Watch out, guys. Sharing the kitchen. Oh, in the fridge, Pastor Malcolm. Thank you. But it's an everyday thing. I can't rely on the day I said I do and the day she said I do to, you know, as, as that's it. It's done. It's over. It's an everyday thing. So we talk about our security. You know, I, I, I'm secure that I have a wife, that she's faithful to me. And I pray she's got the security that I'm faithful to her. That's something we have, a relationship every day. Our walk with God. Faithfully betrothed. Now, we're not married yet. Betrothed. That means, basically, put it in our, our, our today's terms, fiancé. We are betrothed. We are promised. It's an everyday thing. It's a relationship every single day that I have. It's a waiting on Christ. What am I waiting for? I'm waiting on, on, on him to come back. I'm waiting for that trumpet to sound. I'm waiting for the day the dead in Christ shall rise and the sea give up, a de- give up her dead. I'm waiting for a day when I see you know, the Messiah coming back. Take me back in that new Jerusalem. To take me back someplace different than this, this earth with all the trials and tribulations. And, and, and the study we had, you know, last Wednesday, yeah, well, thankful for tribulations. Why? Because that keeps us humble. That keeps us in a place where we can hear from God. And God shows us his glory. So what are we doing? What are we waiting for? Are we faithfully betrothed? Let's step into something else here real quick. So I was listening to a guy talk about songs we sing and things we talk about. We don't talk about death a lot. Right. You, you look at all the old hymns we used to do. Most of them have a, a verse about death. Yeah, you, you look at most of the hymnals, you've got four, four, four verses. You ever notice when you, when you go to a church that uses hymn, a hymnal and it's always one, one, two, and four? They always skip that verse number three. Because that's, that's just that oddball verse that either doesn't make any sense whatsoever or you need a Bible study to figure it out. <laughs> and then, then you've got the last verse which talks about death. But not only death, but triumph. We, we sing a song, uh, 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near, my time has come. Still my soul will sing his praise unending 10,000 years and forevermore. I remember the first time... I'm, I'm looking at someone whose health is failing, someone who's in a nursing home, someone who's, whose life expectancy is, is very short. And, and I was asked to sing that song. I got, wait a minute, can I sing that last verse? Am I going to mess somebody up? But I sang it, and I watched the comfort in that person's eyes because they knew they, where they were. You know, we, you know, when we talk about death, you know, death is inevitable. We're, we're all going to go the way of the grave unless God comes back before them. And it's, people have been looking for the coming of Christ for the last 2,000 years. People stood there looking up, and the angel says, what are you waiting for? Ain't you got work to do? I paraphrase that a little bit. But, but why, 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 why are you standing here gazing? You know, he's going to come back, but there's no use standing here staring at the sky. Because none of us knows. No man knows the day of the hour. No one knows when Christ is coming back. No one knows when he's returning for his bride. No one knows that. Even, so, even if scholars pin it down, say we come back, all right, we can pin it down to this thousand years. What good does that do? That's a thousand years. I'm not going to live that long. So if you pin it down to a hundred years, okay, so what? 
You know, we, we talk about our jubilee in, in like the next 50 years, and I say, yeah, I'll, I'm looking for the next seven. I'm figuring if, if, if I'm around, I'm, that makes me, what, 103? You know, and Paul said, you know, to live as Christ, to die as gain. I'm not, I don't know if I want to live that long. You know, and, and, and when people talk like that, it, people get scared. It's like, I don't want to live that long. Oh, don't talk like that. You know, I want to live as long as, long as God lets me live. And I want to be faithful as long as God let me, lets me live. But Paul said, as Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And again, we get attached to our human relationship here and realize that death wasn't part of God's plan, but it is part of the plan now. It, it's going to happen. It's part of the curse. It's, we're, we're all going to go the way of the grave. So, what has it got to do with faithfully betrothed? betrothed? Imagine you're engaged and your fiancé is going to prepare a place for you and you're going to die. You might die before that happens. In Christ, that's not a big deal because God is bigger than, than my flesh. He created this flesh. He, he rose himself from the grave and he can bring me from the grave, bring my soul unto him. So death doesn't have to be a limiting factor on, com- on, on Christ's second coming. Death is not a factor. Actually, death is, is something that has to happen. You know, we started it in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in a watery grave. That is our... We begin our betrothal right there. We become the bride of Christ. We become part of the bride of Christ when we accept the death, burial, and the resurrection. When we accept that... Who was it talking about the, the sacrifices and the, and, the, and the blood of bulls and goats? Pastor Kirk, or Pastor Mark, Pastor Kirk. You know, we don't have to do that anymore. And because none of that could ever take away my sin. Because I was buried in there, I, I, I took his, on his name, the family name. Because I became part of the church. Not necessarily Christian Fellowship Church, but the body of Christ. Because the body of Christ is bigger than, than this room and these, these red chairs. Jim, it's hard not to call them blue chairs, even though. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. Somebody brought a yellow chair up here, too, and that was even. even <laughs> I don't know. And anybody, anybody ever see the, the original yellow, yellow chairs on uh, 621? Yeah, a couple of people in here. Things that we, we kind of plug into our head. But the body of Christ, it's not Christian fellowship. We're just a small part of the body of Christ. I got rambling. I don't, I'm missing some of the points I want to make. Um, in Psalms 116, starting in verse 12, says, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Will I take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord? I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am truly thy servant. I am thy servant and thy son, son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosened my bonds. No man knoweth the day nor the hour. No one knows. So that goes back to the, what's on the marquee out there, faithfully betrothed. So think of engagements. How, how many, so we got quite a few married folks in here. How long are we all engaged for? Six months, nine months, a year? Any, anybody engaged for longer than a year before they got married? No, we usually get, the, what, two years? Okay. Usually we try to get that done pretty quick, you know? But this, this betrothal is, could be the rest of our life, faithfully betrothed. And you look at an engagement. It's a commitment. And the husband and the wife are committed. No other relationships outside of that engagement. And it could be for a year or two years until, until the marriage is consummated, until they stand up in the altar and say, I do, and, do all the, and start that life together. But we're betrothed every day. And that's, that's, and as a fiancé wakes up every morning thinking, waiting for her wedding day, waiting for the day to walk down the aisle, to wait, all the things that come with a wedding, and, and the home that, that she's going to that her, her, uh, her groom is preparing. And that's where I'm at today, looking at that. And I, I want to set that up as, as, 
as an encouragement, admonishment, warning every day. Faithfully betrothed. Now, what does that mean? Now, within a husband and wife flesh, you know, we, we kind of know what that means, you know. It means I'm not going out looking at any other women. I'm not dating anybody else. She's not going out and dating anybody else. Not going online and starting up chats with, with, with some guy just to kind of get a, a relationship going there. No. It's two people. They're, they're committed to each other. So betrothed to Christ, part of the body of Christ. Now, what does that mean? That means we're ready every day. It goes back to that statement, security of the believer. What does that mean? That means a relationship every day, right here, right now, every day. Now, sometimes we, we get, as the scripture says, my people have forgotten me days without number. Can, can that be us sometimes? You know, we, we wake up in the morning and, and we set up a routine. I'm going to pray, I'm going to read, and then all that goes out the window because my alarm clock just went off and I've got to be at work right now. And, you know, it's about planning. Now, there's always a joke that, you know, it's good to be a man because wedding plans just happen. <laughs> yeah. A lot of that is true. There was, my, my, my wife and, and her uh, bridesmaids handled quite a bit. But there was a lot of planning to do. We had the, the fiancé and the uh, financier. So there's a lot of plans to be made there. You gotta, even, if I, even if I'm not planning the venue, I'm still planning on how to pay for it. There's a lot of planning that, that goes to a wedding. Well, God's got the most of it done. I mean, he, he's going to prepare a place for us. Yeah, my father's house, many mansions. He's going to prepare a place. And not only that, he sent us a comforter that, that we could, that, that, that we were not without him. So it's an everyday thing. It's a relationship. When we take on the name of Christ in that tank, and I know I keep going back to baptism, it talks about the gift, the Bible talks about the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now there's a lots, of gift, lots of gifts of the Holy Ghost. You know, evidence of speaking in tongues, prophecy, a lot of different things. You can name them off gifts of the Holy Ghost. But this isn't, you know, even talking about the gift of speaking in tongues. Well, the gift is for the unbeliever. Sometimes even as a faithful Christian, God will allow someone to speak in tongues. Why? So he can show you something. But that's the gift God gives for his purpose. Any gift that God gives you is for his purpose and his glory. We get to enjoy him, but it's for his glory. But the gift of the Holy Ghost, that's the indwelling of God's spirit in our life. And the scriptures talk about walking in the spirit, living in the spirit, Amen. and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because that's the big excuse. Oh, it's hard and I'm only human. Oh, that is true. So what should be the very next thing? If I mess up, I find myself, hey, that was sin. I shouldn't have done that. What's the next thing to do? You repent and you get back to walking in the spirit of God. You get Because you realize, you know, why did that sin happen? Because I wasn't nurturing that relationship. I wasn't walking in the Spirit of God. I wasn't following Him. I was following something else. Oh, hey, God. Oh, oh, oh. I was following something else. You know, we, we try to make excuses for sin. You know, Scripture says there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful with the temptation. He will provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Sorry, Pete, I didn't give you that one, but um, a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So where's that way of escape? I think this may sound like a broken record because a lot of sermons I use this example, but it, it, I think it's still very relevant. Where's that way of escape? That way of escape came long before you were looking for it. If you, if you, when you find yourself face to face with sin, that way of escape came back came long before that. That way of escape is going to be evident because you're walking in the Spirit. That way of escape will be evident because you're following Him. You're listening to His Spirit. You're taking the time in His Word. You're taking the time to go seek Him. How many of you have ever been caught, well, just say in a job, you're doing something and all of a sudden you don't know how to do something. Something you probably should have known how to do, but you didn't, you forgot how to do it. And you got to go dig up the manual real quick and read how to do it, you know. And it's something that you should have already known how to do. Something you already knew the task was coming. And that's the way we are sometimes with prayer. Sometimes, you know, the confession is good. You know, we, we get to the point where just on autopilot and I forget to pray and I forget to take that time. Well, if I'd taken my time to pray, God would have shown me, hey, you know what? 
Maybe you ought to, and this is going to sound really simplistic, hey, maybe go to work this way today. Maybe don't wear that, those clothes today. You ever, you ever ask God, hey, what clothes should I wear this morning? Yeah, that, that sounds pretty silly sometimes. But you know what? God will tell you. You're down to, hey, I should, God, should I wear these shoes? It sounds silly. But God has his purpose in it. It's not because I can't figure out how to pick out a pair of shoes. But sometimes if you're just yielded to God, God will tell you, do this, do that. Say these words. Do this. Don't do that. Don't go in that office. Go over here. Talk to this person. Avoid that person. And those all sound very simplistic. But God knows how to keep his faithful. He knows how to keep those that are listening to him. I'm going to go back and read this again. And it came in in, uh, Revelation 21.9. And there came to me one of the seven angels. This is is John. He's having a vision. God's showing him something. An angel is showing him something. And, and, And there came unto me one of the seven angels. An angel's coming to him. All right, it's big right there. Which had seven vials. It's a cup, a container. It's got something in it. full of the seven last plagues. Oh, wait a minute. That don't sound good at all. I'd be kind of scared at that point. Angels coming to me with a a vessel, a cup, a vial of of death, destruction. I'd be a little scared about that. But he talked with me saying, come hither. Okay. I will show you the bride the Lamb's wife. So he's showing him the end when the New Jerusalem. Now this is something, you don't see the word wife. I don't think I've seen it anywhere else in relationship to the church, the bride of Christ, Jerusalem. That means it's done. He's showing him the very end, the wife of the Lamb. That means it's finished. That means prophecies have been fulfilled. There's a lot going on. And this is just a little two verses of Revelation. There's a whole lot going on there. And he carried me away in the spirit into a great high multitude and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of the heaven of God. So that's all new. God's bringing us back to him. And this is the new Jerusalem. This is what we're waiting for. This is why we're being prepared. You know, in, in, in the Jewish tradition, you know, the shows in the Bible it shows you know, marriages and in, in Jewish tradition, you know, the, the bride had to be ready at all times. This is kind of cool. So I'm going to step back a little bit. So it might be a question you wonder, you know, you got, here we have four elders here in the, our local congregation, Pastor Parrish Lee, Pastor Malcolm Zechariah, Pastor Kirk Orloff, and myself, Pastor Giebler. So who are your pastors? And it, this, this, as men, this is hard to say, but we take care of each other. We shepherd each other. And it's not a, a hierarchical authoritative, you, you. No. And neither is it here. We have a job to do. We're shepherds. We, we look out for the flock. We look for you know, what's going good, what's not good. Well, who needs to, you know, God shows us someone needs a warning. God shows, shows someone that needs a word of encouragement. God gives us a, a sermon to preach on, a study to teach. Now, the bride of Christ the church, us, as a group. also talks about, and we're gonna, I'm going to read from Matthew 25. In a wedding, you have bridesmaids. They all help take care of things. Well, we are collectively the bride of Christ. We are the church. As individuals, we need to look out for each other. So you can say as, individ, as, as the, the bride has her bridesmaids to make sure we take care of each other. We take care of each other. So we're collectively, we're the bride of Christ. But we all take care of each other in a similar way as the, as the bridesmaids make sure everything's taken care of for the bride. You know, who's your brother's keeper? You know, we are our brother's keepers. In, in, in the body of Christ, we all take care of each other. You know, we're all waiting collectively for Christ to come back because we are waiting for that triumphant entry for, for God to come back and, and, and take us back. Amen. And we all need to look out for each other. Amen. And that's a, that's a humble thing. It's not, you know, I mean, if you see your brother overtaken in a fall, you know, you which are spiritual, you know, you go and lift him up. 
not with pride, not with, not with, hey, you messed up, you know, you know, takes a humility because, you know, I, I could be susceptible to the same thing my brother or sister could be guilty of. I have to come, to, it's not a matter of just rebuking and saying that someone's wrong. So talking about being ready, I'm going to read from Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened under ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them are wise, and five with them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered and said, Not so, let there not be enough for us and you. Go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open up, open unto us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So that's, that's pretty serious. You know, we like to, a, a lot of people, you, you hear people say, and I'll just get right on my deathbed. You, you may not get that chance. And even if you think about it on your deathbed, do you know that God's going to honor that? I'm not saying I'm judging anyone. I don't, have, <clears throat> I don't have the right to judge any man's soul. I can judge what I see. It says, with the judgment that ye judge, you know, it should be a righteous judgment, but judge not that ye be not judged. Yes, I don't judge a man's soul. So if I'm on someone's deathbed and they're, and they're making their confession, if they're saying they're drawing close to God, that's between them and God at that, at that point. I'm there to facilitate as a minister. So I'm not going to pronounce anyone's judgment. But do you want to wait? Do you want to chance that? You know, do you do you want to be as one of the the, the five foolish foolish virgins who 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 weren't ready, who didn't have the oil in their lamps, who didn't prepare? I mean, I'd say if if if, if I mean, think about it: having oil in their lamps, having being prepared, ready to go into the marriage. If I knew it was that serious, I'd want to check that oil every day. You'd be like in your car, I'd be out there five, every five minutes checking the dipstick for the oil, you know? You know? And this lamp is, is more important than, than, the, than the oil in your car. You want to check that oil every day. How, how do you do that? You're praying, studying. It's really that simple. Fellowship. You, you ever get in fellowship, and maybe you hadn't been in fellowship for a little while, and you start talking to your brother, and it's nothing that they said or did, but you could just see the kind of ref, the reflection of yourself, and you realize, hey, I'm not where this brother's at. Yep. Hey, I, I'm I'm missing something. This this guy's got something. This sister has something, Amen. and I am found lacking. Yes. And that person may not even know it. They might. They might not. It doesn't matter. That's why fellowship is important. Not to embarrass anybody. Not to to make you feel bad, but. Just like standing in front of a mirror, and James talks about looking into the perfect law of liberty. Sometimes you see the law of liberty in your your brothers and sisters. You get a chance to see a glimpse of, okay, I'm not right. And that's an awesome thing, because then you get a chance to fix it. You know, when when you get rebuked, when you get, when when God chastens you, you know, we could take that as, oh, man, I messed up. But rejoice. Why? Because you get a chance to fix it. Because if it never happened, you wouldn't know. And if you didn't know... You know, you, you, so you, you ever get accused of something, you know, maybe a officer, you know, police officer pulls you over or does something, and, and then you, he says, well, according to this regulation, you did this and this. Well, I wish I would have known. And it's too late. You're getting that ticket. <laughs> Ignorance is not an excuse, especially in God, because we talk about what, what do we get when we, when we take on Christ, the gift of the Holy Ghost? Because yes, he's there. He's right there every day. I may not listen to him every day, but he's there. God is faithful. So there is no, no, no chance to say, I didn't know. You know, people say, you know, who, you know, some people have never heard the gospel. They may have never heard the physical words that you have heard, but no one can say they haven't heard the Spirit of God. I mean, how many people have you ever heard of that said, you know what, God showed me I need to get baptized. 
Not even going into scriptures. God showed him, you need to get right. You need to repent. You need to come to me. Amen. And then they come to a church and someone teaches them. God already showed them before they ever got there. Amen. So there's no excuse. All right, I think I've left my notes quite a bit here. So, I'm going to back up in Revelations, Revelations 19.6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as a, the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunderings saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. His wife has made himself ready. That's us. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Are we contending for the righteousness of the saints? That's something to strive for. And, and, and again, we can't do it on our own. It's not something not, not I can say, well, I got this habit, I got to fix it. It's good to have that thought, but I don't, I don't do those things on my own. God may give us steps on how to do it in the flesh, but i got to seek God on how to do it. Amen. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All this, the white, the linen, that's, that's, that's the righteousness that only comes from God. Nothing that can ever come from me. You might wonder, all right, New Jerusalem. I'm not a Jew. I'm not Jewish. But we are that wild olive branch grafted in. Uh-oh. Somebody's phone. There we go. Um, I'm the wild, we're, we are that wild olive branch grafted in. Why? Because when Jesus died and he was buried and he rose again, he rose for everyone. Even if you look back in the Old Testament, you know, the Hebrews, the Jews, that God made a way for those that were around to be a part. That anyone that designed, desired to worship the God of Israel, there was a way for them to be in. And this, this is how... Our avenue, we are the wild olive branch grafted in. We are part of, part of being Jewish, but we're not of Jewish lineage. But we have the ability to, to worship that same God that, that, that the Jews mostly have rejected, to be part of that bride of Christ, to be part of that new Jerusalem that's coming down. It got quiet in here. We've talked this month a lot about marriage, about the relationship, about husbands and wives. And that's important. And we're going to read a few more scriptures. I know it's a little lengthy, but I'm going to go back. I think we've hit them in a few more sermons from my brother Armand and uh, Brother Jesse Reardon. We'll read from Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, I, I want to I key on this for a second. Because we, we get stuck on this whole submission thing. But it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So what does that mean? Christ is the head of the church. So... Yeah, wives, submit to your husbands, but your husbands as Christ. Well, that means the husbands have got a role to play in it too. So how, how did Christ treat, treat the church? Before, before I ever repented, before I ever admitted my sin before I was even born, before man realized it, he gave his life. God gave his son 
for our sins before anyone ever said, I'm sorry. Before anyone realized that, hey, I'm, I'm sinning against God. It's the other way around. God gave that blessing. God gave the, the Christ to die, to, to be subject to torture and to death on a cross, to be buried in a grave and raised three days later and ascended to heaven. Did that before anyone could ever say, God, I'm sorry, I acknowledge my sin. So you bring that back down to the man and the wife. So if the wife is to submit to the husband, the husband has to have that kind of love for his wife. Because husbands and wives, we mess up. We do things that hurt each other. We say things that, 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 that are painful. We, we forget things. We blow things off. We, we get full of ourselves. And So if I expect my wife to be submissive, then I have to have that same love back for her. That doesn't work. It's not a one-way street. It's not a subservient type thing. And I, and I heard Pastor Elise did this. It sounded like marriage counseling, but he did this in a, in a wedding ceremony. Husbands, we don't get to demand that our wives are submissive to us. That is a, that's a commandment. That was something here that, that was in Scripture that given to us that the wives are supposed to do it. That's their choice to do it. It's a voluntary thing. Voluntary thing. We don't get to demand. They're not our slaves. We don't tell them, "Thou well, you know, thou shalt submit, woman." No. And but it's a two-way street. If we expect that type of love and devotion, because it's not about a, a subservient thing. It's about love and devotion one to another. Because as Christ loved the church, we are to be submissive to Him. So if that's the model. And if I'm submitting to Christ, what does that mean? Because that's bigger than, hey, don't touch my cheeseburger in the fridge. That's bigger than that. That's bigger than, hey, don't take the last glass of milk. Hey, pick your towel up off the floor. Hey, you know, whatever. Hey, um, have dinner ready for me. It's bigger than any of that. It's submitting to Christ on a daily basis, submitting to the Spirit of God on a daily basis. At the church, us as individuals, being betrothed to Christ, faithfully betrothed every day, a lifetime, lifetime mission of being faithfully be, faithful in that betrothal to, to, to God every day of our life unto death, knowing that Christ is going to raise us up again. All right, I didn't get past two verses in that, did I? Therefore, the church is subject unto Christ. So let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might present it, being the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, he, that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought the men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth it, cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are the members of the body of his flesh and his bones. Does that sound familiar? Where, where do women come from? From, from the flesh of, of man. For we are the members of his body, of his flesh, his bones. <clears throat> Pastor Lee mentioned something up here earlier in the, in the scripture reading, and that kind of put a different light on the blood. You know, we don't partake of the blood of an animal because the blood was the life, is the life, and they would sacrifice that blood to, to other gods and drink that blood. Christ said, no, that's the life. It's, you're, you're sacrificing that unto me. But yet, the blood we do partake of, is the blood of Christ, Amen. the body of Christ. We are members of his body, his flesh, his bones, because we can partake of that because he died and rose again. Amen. And the, it's, a, it's a good way to think of you know, communion when we take it, being part of his body, his flesh. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. 
I think we kind of leave off on this last couple scriptures and don't get into it much. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the big thing is here, Christ and the church, the bride of Christ, faithfully betrothed. What are we waiting for? What are we doing while we're waiting? And then that brings in the whole model of husbands and wives. And it puts a whole different light on anything that the world wants to put on marriage. It, it changes the whole thought and idea of anything what man wants to say a, a relationship is. And it shows this is the model. And again, this betrothal is unto, even unto death. And uh, John 14.1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me, believe in you believe in God, believe in me also. If my fa- in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you, you may be also. Anybody read the book Love Dare? The movie Mo- Love Dare? It, it really brings it down to a, a man and a woman, a husband and wife, figuring out their marriage, getting things back on track. A man that had messed up and wanted forgiveness. And it, and it breaks it down into, you know, why should I forgive? Why should my wife forgive me? Why should a husband forgive the wife? Either way. Why? Because Christ loved us enough that he forgave us when we didn't deserve it. So sometimes my wife forgives me and I don't deserve it. And that, that's, that's the way relationships are. Because sometimes we get hung up on he did me wrong, she did me wrong. Well, he did this, she did that. But if we focus on those two pieces, submitting to your husband, husband loving your wife as Christ loved the church. Husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. And and people want to take that into the, or into the superhero role of, you know, I'm going to die and be the martyr. Yeah, we don't get to do that, guys. Once we're dead, once that bullet hits us, we're done, we're gone. I, I, I might go out in a blaze of glory, but it's over. I can do no more. If I'm going to lay down my life for anything, it's right here, right now, on this earth, while I'm still breathing, while my heart's still beating, because that's the only chance I got. And that's in life we lay our lives down. And yet even in, you get those pieces right, and that, that changes everything. Then it's no longer, well, I can't, I, I can't forgive her. I can't be nice about this because she did that to me. Or I can't do this because he did that to me. If I focus on my part, if I focus on what I'm supposed to do, and, you, and we've got a relationship with Christ, God will work all those things out. God will show, I'm, I'm going to go back to being prepared. I mean, how many of you have been mad at your spouse and you wanted to give them what for, you wanted to get your pound of flesh, you... Yeah, I saw some hands, you should keep them down. <laughs> but it's true, it happens. We, we get mad at our, our spouse. And we want our revenge, our pound of flesh. We want, I want to hear her say, I'm sorry. But you know what? On the same side of that, God ever said, go in the room and you say, I'm sorry. Or you walk in the room and you say this. God, I don't want to say that. And God says, no, you do this anyway. Because we, 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 we kind of predestine our own conversations. Because I'm going to say that, and she's going to say this, and yeah, it's self-fulfilling prophecy because you made it happen. But God gives us a way out. God gives us a way to repair. Because sometimes we say hurtful things to each other. Sometimes we get mad at each other, and, and I'm like... Y- y- I saw men in black the, in, in the car with the, see that red button? Don't ever push that button. Well, that button's there. We want to nail that button every time. I want, whatever that button's going to do, it's bright red and it's going to do something and I want to hit that button right now. No. 
Why? Because it, it, it's the itch we want to scratch. It makes us feel good at least for a couple minutes until it blows up on our face and it's like, yeah, that wasn't good. It, it's all about relationship. And back to the beginning, faithfully betrothed. Back to the beginning, what are you waiting for? Back in the beginning, we talked about security of the believer. What, do you, what, what are you doing to be secure? How are you securing that relationship? How are you securing the relationship with your, with your spouse? I'll take it even a step further. How are you securing the relationship with your family, with your children, with those around you? How are we securing our relationship with God? i got one final scripture as I close. What do we do? When it's all said and done, what do I do when I, when I realize that I've kind of messed things up? In uh, Joel 2, 12 and 13. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great kindness and and repenteth him of the evil. God's there ready, ready for us to, to turn back to him. God's ready for us to turn to him in the first place. God's ready for us to say, I yield to you, that I can't do it on my own. He's ready for us to say that I, I yield unto you my ways. He's ready for us to, to say, I'm sorry, I've messed up. But he's already, he's already there for us. That's just it. He's already there waiting for us. Amen. Thank you.